a lot of residents um, are somewhat afraid that they've been in the you know uh, the mentor student role for a long time and uh, now they're getting out of that resident mode and going out into the private world of medicine and uh, they may be a little embarrassed to um, ask the right questions and um, may have a little reticence to um, to to ask those right questions um, one of those uh, is that about um, the, res the reluctance to ask a lot of sensitive information, especially when it comes down to finances, et cetera. I see a lot of resistance in that. And residents shouldn't really feel embarrassed. Uh, uh, you know, you are entering the private practice world and um, you are entering a contract negotiation process and it's important to ask questions um, of your future employers. Just as in the residency process, you learn a lot about medicine along the way. You are now entering another world uh, where uh, a lot of terms will be thrown around, um, a lot of uh, acronyms, etc., which are not going to be familiar to you. It's very, very important not to, you know, um, glide over those if you don't understand negotiation points or terminology, um, because they may come back to haunt you later. Another thing, a lot of residents in the negotiation process, in the wine and dine process, uh, may be promised things. Um, your call may be one in three, it may be one in five. You may get to be in the new office, etc. But then they find out, number one, it's not in the contract um, when they get that final written contract. Um, only to find down the road when they do sign the contract and start their work um, that those things may not bear fruit or they may have been misled. So one of the points being, and I hate to be skeptical about this, but if, if it doesn't exist in the contract, it doesn't exist. And you can't just take their word for it. In terms of financial due diligence, um, a lot of residents may ask or wonder, how much information am I entitled to receive? The first interview is to get an idea of the fit. Um, can I work with these people? Once you kind of bridge that and you get through that and said, hey, I can work with these people, then you're going to ask the follow-up questions uh, you know, on subsequent meetings. Then you can get into the nuts, nuts and bolts about money. Um, again, most practices should be forthright about those dollars and cents. Um, if they don't, it's, it may signify one of two things. Number one, that they, again, are not managing their finances well, and so they don't know those answers, honestly. Or number two, they may have something to hide, and that's not also good. In some situations, um, a group may not be able to give you the right answers in terms of the finances of a practice. That may not necessarily be dishonesty or anything like that, um, but certainly may smack of, well, hey, this practice may not have the appropriate um, accountants in place, the appropriate uh, financial tools in place, so it may be representative of a practice that doesn't really handle their own business too well. Another excellent question to ask is, what is the group's long-term and short-term outlook and goals? Um, first of all, find out if you take them for a loop when you ask them that question. They may not have a, an outlook or goal, um, but having said that, if they have one, that's good. That means that the group has a bit of foresight, a long-term growth plan. Um, as part of that growth plan, it'll be also interesting to find out what their capital expenditure plans are. You may be joining them at a certain point in the practice, and lo and behold, they're about to open a new practice that's a $10 million office, and you're going to be on the hook for your percentage of that. Looking at a balance sheet of an organization uh, is certainly an interesting question to ask, and that kind of depends on your um, comfort level with the group you're negotiating with. It's certainly understandable if they don't want to share that with you because it is the heart of the finances of the group. Um, however, if they can provide you with that information or a general outline of that, that would be invaluable. In that balance sheet, you're going to find out one important thing, which is cash flow. Um, do they have the cash flow in the organization to meet their monthly uh, obligations to the employees as well as the partners in the practice? Pay the light bills. Another part of that is the debt sheet. Okay, there's good debt and there's bad debt. Um, good debt is debt that is used to finance um, different things like buildings, um, uh, structures, um, um, investments in dialysis centers, things like that that generate revenue. Bad debt could be debt that's used to pay day-to-day -day uh, day -day operations. The overhead to revenue ratio. Most practices, you're, when you are, again, in the investigating process of a practice, you'll want to find out what their overhead percentage is. Most practices are going to run in a band of overhead of somewhere between 40 and 60 percent. Okay, If a practice is running really lean, uh, they're able to be very efficient, not hire too many staff, they may be a little bit lower than that, and that's great. 
Um, if the practice overhead is a little bit higher, um, greater than 60%, you may want to you know, find out where those expenses are coming from and why those expenses are so high and see if there's room for improvement. But that could be you know, uh, signs of a practice that could be doing better in terms of efficiency. Another thing that you're going to want to look at is the uh, payer mix. Um, is there a lot of Medicare in that particular area? Is there a lot of private insurance in that area that you're going to practice? Uh, what about HMOs? What type of contracts are they uh, negotiating at? And the income distribution plan will fall into usually three categories. One is that it is a um, even distribution plan, i.e., um, there is there are five practice partners, a million dollars of revenue, um, and then each person gets two hundred thousand dollars. Okay, that's an even distribution plan. The second one um, is based on productivity. All right. So you will be compensated as a percentage of productivity that you bring to the, to the practice. Third may involve some sort of mix where there's an element of your salary which is productivity based and part of it that is based on an even distribution to all physicians. An example of that is where, um, say, in a uh, urology practice, say, one doctor may be doing uh, cancer surgery. They may be involved in three, four, five, six hour cases all day. They may not generate the revenue as a doctor who's in the office who's seen 30, 40 patients that day. So you need to be able to compensate each one equally for the amount of work that they're doing, but also allowing for the fact of the different types of work each physician is doing in the practice. Now, one of the interesting correlates of that when you look into income distribution plans where they're even or productivity based, um, is that you need to make sure that most of the physicians are pulling their own weight in the practice. Um, there may be an older or senior doctor or somebody that doesn't necessarily pull their weight. Sometimes that can be a point of contention in a group, especially if they're on even distribution plans. When do you become a partner in a practice? Usually the salaried employee to partnership track is also a safety mechanism for the practice because they can evaluate you as a employee and subsequently as a partner. And usually this will be offered to you in the one, two, or three year time frame. And if it's earlier, certainly that's a good option. You do need to be a little cautious or careful if the partnership track is made vague to you or if it's a prolonged partnership track greater than three years. Uh, usually in the first year of practice, you are going to be losing money to the practice as you kind of ramp up. Your second year of practice, you're usually starting to build up and maybe you're making your income. Third year is usually and typically in most practices when you're really starting to build up your own reputation, your practice is really going. There should be a buy-in clause, which is explained, as well as a buy-out clause. Um, you want to find out what that buy-in entails, okay? And that could be as much as just the fixed assets of the practice. Um, how much does it cost uh, uh, for all the computers, your share of the computers, your share of the blood pressure machines, your share of the, um, the secretary's desk, all of those things. So it could be hard assets. What you'll want to kind of uh, keep an eye on is if the buy-in also potentially includes an element of uh, goodwill, okay? Because that's hard to quantify or qualify, uh, especially in this day and age when insurance contracts can you know, uh, blow up and smoke overnight, the goodwill of a practice could really also evaporate overnight, or if it's dissolved for any odd reason. Um, so ultimately, the best buy-ins are a portion, a uh, fair portion uh, or proportion of the fixed assets of a company. So goodwill does have a monetary value, but um, as the word goodwill means, is it can also be a very uh, esoteric or vague term. Um, and uh, it's hard to really put a proper price on that. So the important thing to know about contract negotiations um, is that this should be looked at as a, as a cooperative process. Uh, you're not here to buy a car. Uh, we're here to get the best deal and, and walk away without our ongoing relationship. You're here to join a uh, physician or a group of physicians and hopefully enter a long-term relationship. Um, and it starts with the contract negotiating process. So after you get an idea that you like these people and you'd like to spend more time with them and enjoy working with them, then you need to start looking at the nuts and bolts of the contract. Just like if you're going to be ne negotiating any sports contract or anything like that, your best point of negotiation and your negotiation from a point of strength is going to be before you sign. 
the second you sign, um, you know, it's going to be harder for you to negotiate the things that you want. Not everything, of course, can be negotiated. Um, there's going to be certain sticking points or fixed points that the group is not going to budge on, and you'll get a pretty rapid feel for what that is. Um, but it doesn't hurt to ask, I always say. It doesn't hurt to ask, um, and at the worst case, they'll say no. Also understand that as a partnership goes, that this involves a fair amount of compromise. You're not going to get everything that you want. And in fact, you probably need to make a list, um, 1 through 10 or 1 through 20, or whatever it is, of what you really, really need and what your deal makers are and what your deal breakers are. At some point in the contract review process, and certainly before you sign anything, um, you do need to have a, a healthcare attorney involved in that process. Um, that healthcare attorney really needs to be from that geographic area um, because the rules and regulations uh, for um, contracts will change state by state or area by area. I have become so aware that I am not aware of so many of the right questions to ask. And, and at this point I wouldn't even consider signing a contract without a contract attorney who absolutely knows how to keep my best interests as a physician in mind. I've had many people warn me, you know, be sure you understand coverage, be sure you understand licensing, be sure you understand not to sign a contract until you've really had an attorney look at it and know that, you know, my best interests are protected. And those are the surprises with imminent student loan payments, you know, as soon as you finish graduation that, you know, I want to have something in play. And I want to be able to make good decisions mm -hmm. with the contracts because I've heard too many people come and say, I wish I had known. That do not sign anything until you have an attorney look at it. I mean, because there's so much legal wording that we don't even understand. Um, and I know that I've gone over a contract with an attorney at one point, and he picked up on things that I would never in a million years have, have caught. Um, and so he just, the way he worded things, and even sometimes it's like little minor points, but they do turn out to be something that can be very important later on. And you can't just, even if you end up working for your dad's practice that you've joined or whatever, you know, or this is a friend of the family, you still have to treat it like it's a business and you cannot take anything personally and you have to, you have to do this with a private party and you just have to have it looked at by an attorney. It's of the utmost importance. Depending on the type of uh, practice that you join, some places may give you a sky-high salary, especially if they're backed by a hospital or something like that. So you'll have to be careful if they offer you a pie-in-the-sky salary your first year because that second year may not be so pretty once you come away from those, um, that, that income support from the hospital or the group. So you'll have to look at what your first year salary is from that group, but also have an, a realistic expectation of what your second, third, fourth year salaries are going to be. That brings up a, an important point is that there's a difference between your salary and your compensation. Salary is just that number that you're getting, the, you know, and compensation implies the entire package. Um, that can be your 401k, your disability plan, malpractice coverage, um, so all of those things. So you need to look at not only the salary, but the compensation plan all together. If you get through that process, that you like everything that you've seen and heard and looked at, then you can now seriously go into phase two, which is to say, hey, let's talk about the nuts and bolts of this. What is a potential offer to me? And then start uh, going down the financial track.